PM Weekly is starting right now. That's the whole point of the, the exercise is not because I checked the box and, ooh, I did an exercise. No, you actually updated the plan with your findings and now you don't have that issue the next time you did another exercise. Hi, this is Todd DeVoe with Ian Weekly, and this week we're going to be talking about hospital readiness. This program should have been in effect at your hospital this November 15th, just a, about a month ago. So anyway, Nora is talking about how she has programs ready to go for hospital readiness, what the programs mean, how this affects healthcare in general, and, uh, and what can be done about it. And the reason why we're talking about this today is because I actually had a question from Michael Coran, who is a nurse in Kentucky, and he is now in charge of emergency uh, management for his hospital. And he was asking some questions regarding it, got me thinking. And when Nora agreed to come on the show to talk about these programs, I was really excited to have her to discuss what's happening here in the world of emergency management um, at the hospital. Now, this affects everybody because if we can't get these guys up and uh, dialed in for emergency management, you know, these hospitals may go away if they're, you know, in that aspect of things. So this is something that's going to affect us all. So we all should take a time and listen to this. Again, thank you guys for listening. Please share this uh, podcast with your friends and colleagues. Uh, You know, all throughout emergency management, we bring in special guests all the time to discuss cool things. And that being said, you know, if you, if you have anybody who you'd like to hear about, or if you have any topic like Michael did and reached out to us and said, hey, this is something that he's interested in, we'll find somebody and bring them on the show and, and discuss it. And we'll make sure this, we get this information out to you guys. Again, this is our community that we're growing here. Be part of it. Go check out the website, emweekly.com. You can subscribe over there. Uh, you can reach out to me that way. You can reach out to me via LinkedIn if you wish. and Or you can just go ahead and, like I said, pop onto the website and shoot an Ask Todd question over there and, and we'll do our best to, to get this stuff up. I uh, hope that everybody's going to have a great holiday season here. We're into Hanukkah right now, so happy Hanukkah to all of our friends out there that celebrate Hanukkah. Christmas is coming right around the corner. We got uh, Festivus for the rest of us and uh, we got um, we got Kwanzaa coming up as well. So I just want everybody to, uh, and for those of you that uh, don't celebrate or anything you know just enjoy the holidays and the lights and the beauty of it and those that are back east enjoy the snow and those of us that are here out west enjoy the warm weather hopefully that the fires will go away you know uh, to all those those guys that are out there and gals that are fighting fires out there right now keep it up guys and gals we need you uh i'm back from back east guys is a generic term for me so i'm try not trying to leave anybody out but we do need you guys out there doing what you're doing and uh, our hearts and minds are with you and uh, for those of you that are emergency managers out there doing it you know uh, Randy I know you've been really busy buddy and uh, this is a special shout out to you because I know you're out there uh, working and Jenny Novak as well <laughs> you're out there doing it too so awesome guys really do appreciate everything that you're doing and uh, well let's get into the show Hey guys, how you doing? It's uh, Todd here and we're here with Nora O'Brien from Connect Consulting Services and we're going to talk to her about her journey into emergency management and what they're doing over there at Connect Consulting Services. So Nora, welcome to EM Weekly. Thank you very much for having us. We're really thrilled to have this opportunity to share what we do and, and how we can help people respond to, recover from um, disaster as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So, Nora, tell me a little bit about yourself and then how you got involved in emergency management and then how you got to where you are today. Sure. So, 15 years ago, um, actually 16 years ago when 9-11 happened, um, at the time I was working for a state trade association in California representing the nonprofit community clinics that serve low-income populations. And when you work for a state trade association and had anything to do with healthcare access, we got asked to every meeting under the sun around, you know, reimbursement and dental health and medical and, and everything. So 9-11 had happened, the anthrax attacks and also 9-11 really prompted Congress to act and create the hospital preparedness program in uh, 2001. And it took a while for it, those dollars and, and the requirements to... Um, trickle out to the state. So by the time the states got rolling, it was like February of 2002, I got asked to go to this meeting my boss couldn't go to and said, hey, can you go? I heard they're handing out 
emergency planning money for clinics? I don't know. Go find it out and check it out. <laughs> I can't go to this meeting. So um, I knew nothing about emergency management. I knew how to spell it. I vaguely heard of FEMA at the time. We were working on healthcare access. I was a, and my background is advocacy and community organizing. Uh, I've done a ton of media. I've done um, a lot of um, social issues um, in the past. And I didn't know much about it at all. I just knew that the clinics, if they're supposed to be helping these um, other facilities like hospitals assist with disaster response, it sort of made sense to me that we kind of better understand what the process is. So my framework of understanding emergency management and how I came here is community organizing is very similar to emergency planning at the local level mm -hmm. and the state and federal level. It's There's a lot of overlap. So whether you're getting a stoplight at a local community or you're getting a piece of legislation passed at the state or local level, you need stakeholder involvement. You need you need empowerment. You know, you need to have a drive and, and also you have to have buy-in from the locals, understand what those processes are and how you're going to move forward. Emergency management, same way. If you're going to get an emergency plan, you just don't want to have just the usual suspects at the table. You really need, if you're going to deal with people with disabilities, you're going to deal with people with language barriers, you're going to deal with people that, you know, seniors and kids, they kind of, you kind of need to have everyone at the table, same kind of deal. And so that's the framework that I got to understand the emergency management. So I think it made it easier for me because I understood those, um, those principles of emergency management, uh, you know, wrapped around the framework of uh, community organizing. So when I, like I said, I knew nothing. I was representing our um, state association and our clinics at, at the Department of Public Health in California and quickly fell in love with the field because of the my past, 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 uh, past work working in community organizing. And so by the time I left that organization in 2009, I had gotten a lot of planning tools developed that we gotten funding for it in order to have planning tools for California, but that planning template for clinics was actually used not just in not just in the U.S., actually it was used outside. So community clinics all over the country were using our planning template. So we quickly became the national standard. We got um, about $28 million for the supplies and equipment and planning dollars to plan with the local jurisdictions to plan for disaster, everything from personal protection equipment to surge tents and PPE and, um, you know, decon units because it was all specific around health. And so it, when I left, I, along the way, I just because I felt so much in love with the field, I worked on, I was intending to get a master's and I'm getting a pub, um, Masters in Public Affairs, Public Policy with a concentration of disaster and emergency management to kind of give an academic context to the planning work that I was doing, not, not just um, in California, but with my colleagues across the country. We were able to do um, support each of the primary care associations in the country. There's one for every state. We I worked with our colleagues across the country to support each other during big events like Hurricane Katrina, et cetera, and, uh, and also the big wildfires we had in 2007 in California. So by the time I left in 2009, I left my job and it was, you know, it was great. It was a great experience. And I just sent an email to my colleagues. I've left my position and it was great working with you all across the country and great working with you in California. And I was deluged. I was like, oh my God, you're available. At the time, this was in 2009 at the height of the H1N1 outbreak. And I'd been doing pandemic, at this point, pandemic planning for seven years and spent way too many time in meetings, these Deborah. Debbie Downer meetings that were like, where are we going to put all the bodies? Because all the people that are going to die from this pandemic and, you know, those kinds of things. We've had those like Debbie Downer meetings all the time and spent with, you know, a lot of time working with hospitals and long-term care and at EMS and um, Department of Public Health. Um, of, oh boy, this is a lot, you know, a lot of work here. But so this is the height of the H1N1. People didn't have plans. They didn't know how to set up point of dispensing systems. They didn't have enough vaccines. There wasn't enough personal protection equipment available. Right. There was a, a big shortage on PPE and surgical masks and right. N95 masks and all that stuff. And I, and so immediately I started working in a project in New York, a project in DC, and a project in Manhattan couple projects in California, one in uh, in Georgia. So it was like immediately like, and this was almost immediate. I was like within like three weeks of me left, left leaving my job, I had been, you know, I had four 
projects and clients. And so I'm like, duh, this is a thing. And so I, <laughs> why I named our, our company, uh, I want it, did not want it to be Nora O'Brien and Associates. I want it to be bigger than me. And so I looked at for what I had a natural affinity for, which was connecting people to information and resources that support their planning process. And so I like the alliteration of Connect Consulting and here we are. I have a couple questions for you to kind of just build upon what you what you're saying. So one is I, I do get a lot of questions regarding um, hospital readiness, and I just want to spend a couple of seconds or, or minutes on that. Mm-hmm. Sure. What exactly does it mean? Number one for hospital readiness, and number two, people that are looking for information on that, where could they go? Thank you for that. So that's a great question. So the issue is is that there has been. Joint Commission, with the Joint Commission, it really has had pretty pretty stringent and pretty great, I mean, emergency management standards were really built on emergency management principles, which we recommend. Things like, you know, have a plan, you know, test the plan, have, you know, have these systems in place, use it as a command, all those things that are like standard to EM. So there's a lot of overlap with standard EM um, systems. So they've been Joint Commission accredited, but... But the hospital preparedness program, although it's called the hospital preparedness program that's funded by the assistant secretary for preparedness and response, also in mouthful with feds, you know, we just love how many acronyms they have. That's a, a division of HHS. It's really looking at healthcare preparedness. So hospital is sort of like the top of the food chain, so to speak, because they, have, they take the most acute care. But really what it looks at is healthcare system preparedness. Mm-hmm. And where do they go for help? Asper has got a great resource with called Tracy. It's I can get you happy to give you the link, but it's basically training and resources and uh, planning templates, et cetera, for healthcare preparedness. And it could be everything from how to how to dispense medication quickly and how to have a vaccine management system uh, that you need might need to deal with in times of disaster. Things like you know how do I maintain the right proper temperature for vaccines, and it could be or how to on and off personal protection equipment, et cetera, or how do I evacuate safely my healthcare facility? So there's a lot of great resources out there. One of the big things that's been a big driver of healthcare preparedness in the last few years, and now it's come to roost, is the Centers for Medicare Medicaid services. Um, so have now have new regulations by November 15th requiring every healthcare provider that takes those forms of payment that it's not just hospitals, it's long-term care, primary care, psychiatric units, dialysis clinics, um, home health agencies requiring them to have emergency plans in place. Hmm. So it's a newer standard that everyone's going to kind of have to rise to the occasion and meet those standards. I see that being an area that we're going to have to do a little bit more focus on because what I notice, like anything else, right, emergency managers come from all over the spectrum, and I have a few of my uh, connections that I have that are nurses um, that have now moved into the emergency management side, and like Mm -hmm. everybody else, we're kind of like, okay, when we, you know, I I came from as a paramedic, that's where I started, and and moved into, you know, then moved into emergency management, right, and then, so you know, same type of thing, right, and so you kind of stand there when you're your first day on the job, and you're like, okay, well, I know kind of what I'm doing, and then, you know, help. You know, and and I think, right. you know, like writing plans, P- plan writing is an art for sure. It's not everybody who's oh, an emergency like manager that. is a plan writer. You I'm know? with you on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then and plan writing is, a, is an art. And what people don't know is what people want to say, is, I'm checking the box. I've got, but to me, planning is, you know, like your dishes and your laundry are never done. Your plan's never done. Because, you know, I'm, we always tell people all the time as our clients, like, you want a plan that's as dynamic as your organization, mm. you know. We had one plan they asked, uh, an organization asked us to review. They served 100,000 patients in six counties. They had um, like 1,100 employees. And they sent us their plan to review, and it was five pages long. Wow. And I just tried to, like, say you probably need something that's a little more robust that will support effective response and recovery. And I got killed for that. Uh, we don't, this is not California, blah, blah, blah. We don't need it to the command. I'm like, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you asked for my opinion and I told you. But, you know, 
and maybe they were super succinct, but the thing had not been updated since like 1997. That's the other thing too. It's like we tell people all the time, have a plan that's reflective of your organization. Half of your staff that you're referenced in your instant command system don't work there anymore. You've got a problem. You right. got to update that stuff. Yeah. And that's one problem I see with a lot of plans is that they try to make them evergreen and it's impossible right. to do so. I mean, the only thing you can do on Evergreen, you know, to that Evergreen point is we always tell people, put positions. Right. Don't put people's names. Put positions. Yeah, but you still need to go back and, and, and make sure it's... Oh, always. No, no, yeah, yeah. You yeah. Just, just look at it. All it takes is a little bit of looking at it with a fresh set of eyes. Maybe someone that hasn't looked at it every single year for 100 years. Yeah, I, I looked at a plan one time. Just recently, <laughs> to make some, when I say one time, this makes as long as a long time ago. Just recently, and the first, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 pages, something like that, was just talking about what the incident command system, what, it, what NIMS was, and why it's important. And I asked the guy, I'm like, why is this in your plan? I said, this is nice information, but I mean, you could put a link or something or, or a website if people are right. really interested to it. Why are you putting all this information into your plan? And he's like, I don't know if mm-hmm. that's the way the plan always was. And I'm like, wow, you know, I'm not a plan writer, so I'm not going to ever tell people that I am, but at least I know what a a plan should be. And I think that's one of the things where people just don't don't know where to start. So if somebody was going to start a plan, like if today I walked over to you and said, I right. need a plan written about this city or this company or whatever, right. where do you start? Right. Okay. Very good point. In order for us to do a gap analysis, we kind of know what do you have now? So we have to look and see. And honest to God, we're, I won't say the client, we're working with someone. They've sent us a, a whole list of policies and procedures have not been a, updated since 1981. <laughs> they're now sending this and we're working on that so we're just we first do a let's see what you have and let's see where the gaps are and let's and once we do that we'll see where the gaps are for the most part of things that are you know maybe haven't maybe never or an organization that has nothing we um we start with a hazard vulnerability analysis so that's something that's real important. Not a, not a left model of people do an HVA or has their vulnerability analysis, which I can't say a lot, too many times uh, very fast. <laughs> but the HVA will get us at a lot of information about what their external risks are, but what's their internal process? Because it has the whole, when we use the, we really like the Kaiser, both the 2014 and the 2017 tool. We like them. I don't know if you have ever seen the Kaiser Permanente HVA tool. It already has all the, already has the formulas included. It's an Excel, Excel spreadsheet. We like it just because it's really clean. It's not, there's not it just kind of gets at questions of like, what's the risk? What's the probability that thing's going to happen, whether it's an earthquake, fire, flood, or data breach, or whatever those things are? And then what has been your personal preparedness or community preparedness to address that particular event? And it spits out a number, and it kind of tells you where you need to focus your attention. Yeah. So that HVA process, that, for us, that we that's usually, we do a plan review and we do an HVA for almost every client that requests because you kind of need to know what the risks are. And it also gets to those questions of, so what have you done for planning? You know, you're an earthquake country. What have you done for earthquake on the internal side? Or what do you, do you have any idea what your community has done for earthquake preparedness, et cetera? Do you hold, um, or do you recommend holding either way, um, a planning meeting with stakeholders of, of the company first? Or, or do you recommend the, the, that emergency manager to walk around and do his own assessment? I mean, how, how would you tell that person to start that process? Well, if they haven't, so if they're doing it themselves internally, there's two things. There's two parts of the community that are really key. One is you have to have senior leadership buy-in. Nothing's going to happen unless you have it. Like if the senior leaders are not bought into the, the importance of planning, or training or exercising, none of it's going to happen. So, you know, you can talk all day to your blue in the face. So that's something that's really key. So senior leaders have to see the value of it. And of course, for the most part, we're dealing with healthcare providers that are regulatorily required to. So what do you know? We have their attention a little bit more because it means they could lose the ability to accept Medicare and Medicaid if they don't have these plans and systems in place. Right. So, you know, like it's what it, you're, whatever's going to get their buy-in, whether that, hey, they think it's a good idea or, you know. And then the other piece of it is the engagement of the staff that is not just you know, the facilities guy and the janitor and they go in a room and they come out two weeks later with a beautiful color coordinated plan. That doesn't work. Right. 
because the reason that doesn't work is the only two people that know it's in the plan is the gender and the safety guy. Mm -hmm. So that's not going to help. So what we always say is, you know, emergency management is, is a team sport, not an individual sport. And um, you really need to have every bear, every kind of department or every factor of your business or agency or organization included at the planning table when you're developing your plans so that it's reflective. Because when we talk about emergency response or business continuity, because we do both, right. when you're talking about both of those, you know, what business continuity looks like to an IT person versus a facilities or administrative person. And like we work with a lot with healthcare, so a clinical perspective, they think business continuity is very different to each of those different parties. Mm -hmm. So you kind of need everyone at the table to have them better understand so that you have a plan, again, that's, that's reflective of your organization. And that buy-in is really important. And what, what, one of the things that's really key to where you start and where you go from that, don't make emergency management a standalone system that you have to do. Like you're probably doing some kind of process improvement in your organization and, and it could be organizational development. It could be doing a better client management system. I don't know, whatever whatever kind of business or company you're a part of. Make that in emergency management part of your existing process improvement and just make it one other element that you work on. And you have a better shot of, if it's a standalone, it's this thing we'll never get to. Right. But if it's integrated into your other operations, it's just one other thing that we do. You know, it's one other task and, you know, in our column, in our to-do file, rather than, you know, oh, this thing over here, it's, you know, monkey on my back, so to speak, I got to get a plan done. And you have a better shot of it being more integrated and you have a better shot of actually it, it, it really asking, helping your organization, guide your organization during responsive recovery. If it's, if you, if you operationalize it, and if you don't operationalize it, it's a lot harder. Right. You know, I find that interesting too that you say that. I, I found emergency management positions in really weird spots. Everything from I'm with you. Every, yeah. Everything from from you know, facilities which makes sense to operations which makes sense. Right. And then right. um <laughs> I, I mean like even in public even in the public side I've seen it in public works. I've seen it in the fire department, the police department. And the oddest one is mm -hmm. and I don't want to say where it's at because it's actually near and dear to me. It's a city that I, I love. It's in their human resources department. And and, and I, I, I I see that. We see that all the time. And I asked that one time I was talking to the city manager and I said, Why is it in your human resources department? And he said to me, he's like, Well, that's where risk safety was and so just Made sense for us to put emergency management there and i'm like that's like this know. you know because they don't have their, they have their own police department too they don't have their own fire department but that was like really odd for me but anyway because it sits in different places your planning focus is going to be different you know like it used to be business continuity was this thing over there that it folks did because mm -hmm. we want to get our data backed up well, look, those are long gone. Those sales are long. Gone. It has to be, you know, and that's something that we teach for our clients all the time. It's about organizational resilience. Like, sure, you can get your, if your data is still there, but if your building's damaged and your staff can't get to work because they're evacuated and your supply chain's choked, you don't have a business or you don't have a company or you don't have an organization. You're you're screwed. You know, like you can have your data, whoop de doo but you can't actually do the things you need to do if you don't have those other things. Right. <laughs> so, true. so, but I mean, it's been, it's, it's fascinating to me about where it lives because it's always, you know, everyone's got, you know, that it works for them. Great. We're not going to ever say, go the, do it this way, that way. But, you know, the key things is that senior leadership buy-in and local in, you know, and engagement at the, at the line level are really key because, you know, I'm also a big fan of never underestimate a good donut, a good burrito. <laughs> Honest to God, that will help your planning process. Seriously, it doesn't cost a lot of money. You know, tchotchkes, swag, I don't know, whatever you want. It's some like safety committee t-shirt and they're, these people will do stuff for days. I, I don't know. But the point is whatever's going to engage people, give them a damn pen. I don't know. But the point is that they, just, they kind of need, they need to understand sort of what their role is and everyone, and, and basically I've always kind of been a fan of like everyone, however you got to the party of emergency management, you know, you all have something to contribute. Mm -hmm. So let them contribute in my view. The plan for me is, is the end result 
of something that you do together as a collaboration. And I really think that the process of planning is, is I don't say more important, but definitely, I don't know, the, the meat of really what the plan's about. Because the plan will change. Mm-hmm. We put it on the, on the shelf, we bring it out a couple times, we test it, whatever. But that process of getting from A to Z, I think is crucial in that plan, in the plan. And if you don't have the right people in the room, when I mean the right people, the, the decision makers, then that plan never is going to get off the ground. Do you agree with that or am I off base? The answer to that question and more when we return from our break. Emergencies happen. Whether they're related to medical emergencies, threats of physical violence, weather related, or other. One of the most difficult things during an emergency is to find help and quickly and efficiently communicate with all parties, regardless of whether you're an administrator, law enforcement, or the end user. With Titan HST, we help distort time by creating high tech yet simple to use mobile based applications that connect you with the people who can help you. At Titan HST, we believe in the power of people. Hi, this is Todd DeVoe from EM Weekly. If your company is in the emergency management and response space, EM Weekly is a place for you to advertise. Each week, we bring in experts in emergency management, response, and leadership from around the world, and they're here to share their best practices. Our listeners are eager to learn about new products and ideas, so this is the space for you. For more information, please contact Brian at brian at emweekly.com. The plan for me is is the end result of something that you do together as a collaboration. And I really think that the process of planning is, is I don't say more important, but definitely, I don't know, the, the meat of really what the plan's about. Because the plan will change. Mm-hmm. We put it on the, on the shelf, we bring it out a couple times, we test it, whatever. But that process of getting from A to Z, I think is crucial in that plan, in the plan. And if you don't have the right people in the room, when I mean the right people, the, the decision makers, then that plan never is going to get off the ground. Do you agree with that or am I off base? Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. And that's uh, what I always tell people about that. That's, that's something that we, we tell people off a lot with our clients is that the planning is as important, if more impo- if not more important than the actual plan that ends up on paper. Mm-hmm. And the conversations you have around business continuity and, hey, what are we going to do about? And that's why plan testing is so important. And that's mm-hmm. something that we do as well. We spend a lot of time teaching people those muscle memory skills of evacuation or, you know, just do a tabletop exercise and we really have them talk about, well, what would continuity look like if we can't get in our building for four months? Oh, right. I hadn't thought about that. You know, like, like, cause one thing that makes me, and I'll give you some of my soapbox craziness is people write these beautiful actor action reports and they've got color code, you know, photos and they've got, you know, this thing's 30 pages long and they don't implement their improvement plans. And then two years later, they do another exercise and the same damn issues happen. (laughs) Hmm. What do you know? Had you, I know, scheduled or thought to actually use that information that was there to update your plan, you'd be in a better shape right now. So those things that are just, that makes me, that's crazy making for me because that happens all the time. Um, <laughs> that's so true. Completely crazy making. And like, and my clients will know, I mean, this, you know, I tell, I always give them fair warning. I'm like, okay, I'm giving you a soapbox issue. You can tune me out. Like I'm your, you know, I already have one, I already have one teenager who tunes me out. Why not a few more clients? But the point is that's sort of the point you got. That's the whole point of the, the exercise is not because I checked the box of you. I did an exercise. No, you actually updated the plan with your findings and now you don't have that issue. The next time you did another exercise. Oh, that's what that's for. Okay. You know, that, that makes me not. That's, that's crazy making. Um, <laughs> so does that sound crazy to you? Does it not, not so? Or no, it, no, you, you're, no, I'm right there with you. I, I did a uh, fire drill for the organization, this organization I belong to, and uh, we evacuated the building and there were some serious issues, right? Like, first of all, the fire alarm, one, one guy described it sounded like a, uh, a buzzer going off on a, on a dryer. You know, like, eh, like they weren't oh. really sure what it was. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And then, you know, the other person said they couldn't hear it in their office and there's some, some, some serious issues with the fire alarm and they, they have building captains and stuff like that. And so the building captains right. really worked by getting everybody out. So in my after action report, I wrote down that the fire alarm system needs to be changed and 
Right. And the guy who I handed it to tells me, he goes, you, you can't put that in the in the after action report that the fire alarm system needs to be changed. And I said, well, it does. This is a complaint that we found. And he goes to me, he's like, well, no, because if we don't change it, we're going to get in trouble if there's like a fire and they found that we... Like, <sighs> And I'm like, so ignoring the problem is, is better than not. So no. anyway. Well, I mean, here's the thing. It's like, and we're not, it's not about, this is not a gotcha. People understand. It's not about like how much are people going to be running around like that chickens with a head cut up. It's not, you're testing the plan. You're not testing the people. And, but if you don't, if you can't, that makes me crazy because if, if the whole point of you to find you're if you don't find anything, you haven't stressed your plan enough, right? And it's not going to help you. You know, that's the other thing too. Oh, everybody got out, and five minutes later we go back go back to work. No, 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 no. You're going to have some findings, even if you do it once a quarter, a fire drill. You know, oh well, we never used patience before, or we've never done. We only just do vertical. We don't do, you know, we only do horizontal. We don't do vertical evacuation. I'm like, then you're, you know, and you're on the third floor. What the hell? (laughs) Like, why are you doing that? Right. Like, I mean, the point is, if you want to get to some, you know, the point is not testing whether, you know, Maria knows her stuff as an incident commander. That's not what that is. It's about... Did, did the things that you did, you, did you give your, your your staff enough muscle memory to say, okay, I remember we go down this hallway and not that one because of X. Right. That's the whole point. You got to give them those, that muscle memory. So those are the, the big things. The concern that we have moving forward around the CMS emergency preparedness requirements, which I talked about a little bit, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, is these smaller agencies, like you talked about what healthcare goes on where the healthcare agencies go um, to, for help is that they don't the, there's four elements that they're going to have to come up with some of them are pretty good at it and some of them are pretty lost I'll tell you so you have they have to have an, a they have to conduct a, a, a hazard vulnerability analysis the, a lot of these folks don't know how to do that and they have to develop a plan based on your your risks and your outcomes of your HVA and the system has to be all hazard so you can't say I only have a fire drill plan I'm good to go mm-hmm. You have to develop policies and procedures. Now, it's fine if you're a hospital and you've had these for a million years, but if you're a home health agency, if you're a psychiatric unit, if you are community mental health, you probably don't have these. And there's very specific policies and procedures for your providers. There's 17 provider types that are impacted. And um, all of this had to be in place by November 15, 2017. And the policy, so like there's nine policies for hospitals. Long-term care has, skilled nursing has, uh, has eight and PACE programs all inclusive for the elderly have 10 policies. So they have to have all these policies and procedures in place. They also, and they have to review them and update them every year. They have to up, do it, have it HVA done every year, and they have to update it every year. Mm. They have to have a communications plan. And this really came out of events like Hurricane Sandy and Hurricane, you know, going back to Katrina, where these smaller agents, you know, hospitals, they've got pretty robust communication systems, you know, and a lot of these smaller agencies, they think a cell phone is redundant communication. <laughs> so they're going to have to have, which is true. I mean, on, I mean, you laugh. I'm sorry. It's the truth. And they have to have a way to notify staff and patients. They have to have a way to communicate with local, state, and federal and tribal agencies and have a relationship with them for the first time ever. Right. And they actually have to have redundant communication. That's a big one because a lot of these folks don't know the difference between a 700 hertz, you know, 7 megahertz radio versus a satellite phone. You can put them in front of you. They had no idea unless it actually set it on the, you know, on the device itself. And then they have to do a training and testing program that train all their employees, their contractors, their volunteers, and their testing program is they'll not have to do two exercises a year. One of them has to be a full, what a CMS defined full scale exercise, which is an operations based training, uh, operations based exercise. Mm. And, you know, if you know how to spell emergency management like I was 15 years ago, and these people that are contacting us and many other consultants around the, uh, around the country, these people are like the executive directors, uh, you know, secretary, and right. said, I was assigned this two weeks ago. I don't know what to do. Boy. 
you know, and they're going to have to conduct a full scale exercise. So at this point, we're past the November 15th deadline. People just still have to have these systems in place. And so from this point on, after November 15th, the surveyors, when they come by to survey you, they'll now add all of these elements to all the other things they survey you on from either your state or CMS survey. And you'll have to have these in place if they don't have the systems in place and they don't have their plans and their PMPs and, and t- training and testing done, they can get a corrective action plan and they may only have 30 days to comply right. and they'll have to get them in place. So, and if they don't do that, then they can lose the ability to accept Medicare, Medicaid. So it's, uh, they're, they're not, they're not, there's no joke here. They're right. serious. And I think in the, in the long run, I think it's going to be good. I think it's just going to be a bumpy couple of years where they figure out, and this is something they'll have to do each and every year. I think all of these things are great. It's none of this stuff is crazy. This is all like have a plan, have PMP, communications plan, train and test. Those are standard EM things. Mm-hmm. I think in the long run, I think it'll help make regional medical surge better than in past. You can't have just people just closing their doors and say, I'll be back in two weeks when the event's over. Right. That they're not going to be able to do that anymore. Do you think that hospitals should be looking at hiring professional emergency managers to, to come into their area? Or do you think it's okay for them to grab the you know executive director of the hospital's uh, executive assistant and having that person um uh, start writing the plan. I mean, I, my feeling, obviously, as a as an EM, that I'd like to see the profession go in there. But um, I don't know, sure. you know, what do you think? I'm with you on that. I think that we both know what it takes to be uh, a local EM is you guys sit around and wait, you know, drink coffee and sit on your butt waiting for an event to happen. <laughs> oh, no, we have going to, you know. <laughs> Ha 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 ha! That's, we know that's not the truth. We think that we're going to see more uh, more of healthcare systems because what happens is, you know, there's 70, 17 provider types. A lot of these hospital systems, they're not just hospitals. They have, I know one health system in the East Coast. They have every single provider type within their healthcare system because they serve a huge part of Pennsylvania. And we're going to see more and more of that these emergency management programs be more integrated. And we think it's, I think in the long run, I think they should. I think that the other thing, I think what's going to kind of drive this, if some of the big organizations like skilled nursing or, because a lot, I think skilled nursing has the most, I think it's like 17,000 of the 72,000 providers are impacted. Hmm. If some of them actually lose the ability to accept Medicare, Medicaid, you're going to get this huge ripple effect of, oh my God, they're really serious. Okay, now we have to get our act together and they're going to now all of a sudden have um, emergency management programs. I think it's a good thing. I think in the wrong, and I think it's going to be a good thing for response and recovery to have more of a focus in this oper- you know, operationalizing plans and a focus on that. I think that's going to be a good thing. I think it's just until people kind of get with the program, I think the next couple of years are, we're not going to see how, how it all comes out, but I think in the long run, I think it'd be good. So that was a long answer to your short question. But but I think it's going to be a good thing. Right. I, I don't think there's any easy answer to, to any of these questions. And I think you're, you're doing a great job handling them. Thank um, you. So we're coming here to the end. And before we let you go, there's a couple more questions I have for you. But this one here. Mm-hmm. So we just said that this is this is going to impact hospitals and, and another type of care providers drastically. Right. If somebody's interested in getting a hold of you, how could they find you? Sure. They can go to our website, which is connectconsulting.biz. We have a whole CMS section. We've got a blog. We also have a Connect Consulting page on LinkedIn that you can find us there. You can find us on Twitter, which is Engage, Prepare, Recover, or my Twitter account, which is Nora Connect. That's who we are. If you want to, you know, a lot of people are like, I don't even know where to start kind of thing. We have, what we've tried to do is make it as easy as possible. So we've come up with a number of compliance packages. So some people, we've already developed all the planning tools, an implementation guide, a sample policies and procedures for nearly all the provider types. So people just want to purchase our materials. We call that a do-it-yourself. Mm-hmm. There you go. And then some people just want 
some support. So we call that a do it with you. And there are some people that have the resources but don't have the time to say, can you just do it for us? Can you do, can you write our exercise? Can you write our plans? Can you like guide us through the process? You know, we're certainly happy to do that. And we work with a lot of the other consultants around. And so we currently have clients in about 26 states um, and we have colleagues all over the country. What we hope is that, you know, and it's a surprising thing actually in the rule, it says you might need a consultant, which is shocking. I've never seen that in the federal register. I was really surprised to see that. <laughs> um, the, the other thing I know is like, well, especially who's never done any, you know, this is new to you. I, I think I was actually surprised to see that. You generally don't see that much, you know, frankness in, in, um, in the federal register. The other, if there is actual comedy in the federal register, it also says they're trying to estimate how much to, it's going to take for like for an organization to put together an emergency plan. They actually wrote, kid you not, for just nearly about every provider type, eight hours, eight <laughs> staff hours it'll take you. That's just the plan. To do the ATA, that was six hours. And to do a full-scale exercise, that was 10 hours. Wow. Honest. I'm like, maybe the day of right. to do the 10 hours to do the full-scale. I mean, that was true thought comedy in the Federal Register. I was like, That's are awesome. you kidding me? And then they estimated the cost. Honest to God, like, this is just going to take this many nurses and this facility person. And they actually came up with a table and it, the cost of what it would cost for all 72,000 providers, um, all of the 17 provider types of exactly how much they'd have to spend to, to get to compliance. And it was uh, $373 million. And it's based on those eight hours and 10 hour estimates, which to me are completely ridiculous. Yeah. And so I think that number is probably 10 times that. So that was kind of interesting and kind of cute. They actually tried. To <laughs> the truth. I was like, oh, that's cute. You're completely off, but hey, that's okay. Good try. Um, awesome. Yeah, good try. That's awesome. All right. So here comes yeah. the toughest question of the day. Somebody, okay. somebody starting off in in the business. And so we'll talk, since we're talking about hospitals, someone start off uh, as a hospital emergency manager. What book would you hand them to say, read this and you're going to be on your way? You'd be fine. One, there's a blog that I just knew that I subscribe to. It's free. Recovery Diva. I don't know if you know Claire Rubin or know of her. Okay. She has been working in the field of recovery for like 30 years and she's got this great blog. What I love about her blog is that I, she always, just, I think she, it's like only five times a week, I think, you know, or at least three or four times a week we get an email from her and she comes up with reports and, and this is not just U.S. focused. So it's reports around the world and resources, you know, what on the federal side or the public sector side, the private sector side of these great resources that I have so many times used that have been so helpful to me that I was like, oh my God. And it, or and it could be a Bloomberg report or a, you know, report, it could be a GIO, you know, government, um, accountability office report or a congressional report or something like that, that are just really helpful to kind of understand because it's not just specific to don't just think, oh, it's recovery. I'm only thinking about business continuity. No, because it really, it's about response and recovery. And I'm a big fan of Claire Rubin and I, I've met her before and, you know, kind of subjugate myself to her and instead of oh, you're just great at what you do. So she's great. And she also, you know, I just can't say enough good things about Recovery Diva. And it's a good, there's a good, good, a lot of good lessons learned there. Awesome. Cool. And, you know, for those use, for everybody who uh, doesn't have their pencil sharpened right now, uh, we're going to go ahead and put all those links and we'll even include the Recovery Diva uh, in our links down, down in the show notes. So uh, don't... Uh don't fret over that. So awesome. Thank you so much for the Recovery Diva as the book or publication that you recommend. One last thing. We actually, we want to give your readers a discount. So if you want, we actually have two things we can give you. We can give you a 12 point um, free assessment, self-assessment where your organization is in terms of your training, planning and exercise gaps. We'll be happy to send you that. You send us an email, but also we give you a 10% discount on our services for listening and letting us know you heard about us on EM Weekly. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. And everybody to hear that. So if you want to use the services, you know, go ahead and, and, Click on those links that we're going to have down there and email and say you heard it here and uh, you get a little discount. Thank you so much for that. That's uh, that's a wonderful early uh, <laughs> Christmas gift, I guess. Awesome. Sure. Cool. Like I said, I was about to say, if there's anything else you want to add, but you did that. And uh, so thank you so much for being on the show today. Looking forward to hearing from you again. Great. Thanks so much, Todd. Thank you a lot. Thank you so much for having us. 